Hello, welcome to this, the second Sunday in Lent. Let's pray. Almighty God, whose Son was revealed in majesty before he suffered death upon the cross, give us faith to perceive his glory, that being strengthened by his grace, we may be changed into his likeness from glory to glory, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today is from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Our next reading is Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 5 and 13 to 17. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. And to verse 13. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. And our gospel reading is from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, 
the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Lent is a time for us to examine our hearts. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is often drawing our attention to our hearts. He says, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to the judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. This is Matthew 5, 21 to 22. So Jesus moves the focus from from murder to anger. He moves the attention from the outward action to the inward disposition of the heart. So imagine someone filled with murderous rage. They're just full of anger, but they're in prison. So they aren't able to actually commit murder because they're they're in a cage. They're in jail. But we wouldn't say that they they are virtuous for not committing murder, right? Jesus has a similar teaching about adultery. So he says, You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust, and the Greek sort of means with lustful intent, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This is Matthew 5, 27 to 28. So again, Jesus is moving the attention from the outward action to the inward disposition of the heart. So imagine someone filled with lust, right? They are are inwardly entertaining lustful images. It's it's all they think about. But again, say they're in prison and they can't act on those thoughts. They aren't actually able to commit the act of adultery, even though they want to. They don't commit the sinful act. But we wouldn't say that they are virtuous because they aren't committing adultery. So Jesus turns it around now, and he draws our attention to good actions. So he draws our attention to giving, saying, So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. This is Matthew chapter 6, verses 2 to 4. So what if we have a good action, like almsgiving, but our inward disposition is selfish? What if our inward disposition is primarily concerned with managing our public image, wanting people to think highly of us, would that person be considered virtuous by God? They're doing a good action, but their, their real motivations for doing it is for people to think better of them. So Jesus recommends giving in secret to expose our real reasons for giving. <clears throat> Jesus looks at another good act, saying, and whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 6. So what if a person is praying, but they aren't actually focusing on God? Instead, they're focusing on people looking at them. Thinking, these people think I'm holy. It's a bit of a performance, right? Thinking of themselves as eloquent. um, Wanting to be praised because, wow, I wish I could pray with those kinds of words. I wish I could string those sentences together. Would that person 
be considered virtuous by God if the reason they're doing it is so that they can be praised by others and be seen as holy, be seen as eloquent in prayer. Again, Jesus is recommending praying in secret to expose our real reason for praying. If we are okay praying in secret, then our inward disposition is oriented towards God. If we don't want to pray in secret, then it shows what we're really doing it for. So a person might be prevented from acting out murder or adultery, but their inward disposition might be directed towards those sinful actions. Or a person might be engaged in good actions, like almsgiving and prayer, but their inward disposition might be directing them away from those good actions, or what those good actions are all about. Right? So this, this dynamic between outward action and inward disposition is what Jesus is drawing attention to. So learning from Jesus, Paul is saying something similar in our reading from his letter to the Romans. Uh, Abraham is a hero of God's people. Uh, to say you are a child of Abraham is pretty much synonymous to saying that you are a part of the people of God. This was a, a point of pride for, for Paul's people. He is the patriarch of the faith, the patriarch <laughs> of the faith. So Paul is asking, what is it that makes Abraham justified or makes him righteous? Abraham did have works, right? For example, he left his family home to go to the land that God would show him in his old age. Um, he later placed the mark of circumcision on himself and his household as directed by God to be able to form a covenant. It seems as though he did what God told him to do. Abraham had good works. Paul points to the place in the book of Genesis that tells us Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. This is Genesis 15, verses 6. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So Paul points to the inner disposition of Abraham, which was the motivation for his actions. Paul points to the fact that God considers Abraham righteous on the basis of his belief. At this point in Genesis, when God counted Abraham as righteous, he wasn't circumcised yet. And he didn't have the biblical law, the Torah. He didn't have that to obey. And these are the, the traditional identifying markers that Paul's people would have used to refer to a person as righteous. And Abraham didn't have them, in a sense. Abraham was a Gentile at this point. He was declared to be righteous on the basis of his belief. We see something like this in our gospel for today as well. From John chapter 3, Jesus makes reference to a strange story from the book of Numbers where a kind of poisonous serpent was around the camp, biting God's people. People were dying. Um, and when Moses brought the situation to God, he was directed to build a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And when people looked at the bronze serpent after being bitten, they would live, they wouldn't die. And they believed that. They believed in what God told them, and they were saved, right? So they, they believed that God said, look at the serpent and the bronze serpent, and you will be saved. You won't die. And so they believed that. They looked to the bronze serpent, and they lived. It's a strange story. And pointing to this story, Jesus says, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So imagine him on the cross, right? Lifted up on a pole that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. So Jesus points to belief. Why point to belief? Why does that matter so much? Well, belief is the fountainhead. It is the ultimate inner disposition of the heart. Belief says what your, what your life is oriented towards. Right? Or maybe we, we should say who your life is oriented towards. When people get married, 
The ceremony is about people who are oriented towards each other. It is about belief. It is about belief in the other person, in their relationship. It is about trusting that other person. We don't know what kinds of actions will be required of us in that marriage. But what we want from the person we get married to is belief. We want a heart oriented towards the relationship. That is the fountainhead from which all good acts in the relationship will flow. This is like the belief that Abraham had. And this was the, the foundation for the covenant that he made with God. Circumcision ultimately flowed from Abraham's belief in God, in his trust in God, his faith in God. The covenant was based on faith then. What God was looking for from Abraham was his heart oriented towards God, like in a marriage. James does want to give us a little bit of a warning here. Uh, So in his letter, he says, you see that faith was active along with Abraham's works, and faith was brought to completion by the works. Thus, the scripture was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. This is from James chapter 2, verses 22 to 24. He's he's giving us a warning here, right? This belief can't remain without action, and that's not what we're trying to say. That's not what Paul's trying to say. Belief can't remain without action when action is possible, right? But the foundation of the good action is belief. I heard a story once, which I've been thinking about a lot lately. It was about a high school student who was taking a physics class and was supposed to present to her class on the physics of a pendulum. And so like this is a pendulum, right? So it has a a weight on it and it has a string and it will swing back and forth, right? Um, And so she explains to the class as part of her presentation how the pendulum worked, right? It has a weight that's fixed to a point by a rope And she describes the physics and how because of gravity and friction acting on the pendulum, it can never reach the same point that it's dropped from. So she drew these diagrams and she showed the class the formula based on on, on the blackboard. Um, And to really make her point, she set up a giant pendulum in the classroom. It had a heavy barbell secured to the bottom and a rope attached to the ceiling in the center of the classroom, right down the aisle. And she asked if everyone understood and believed what she said about the the forces that were acting on the pendulum, the the pendulum, this is how it would function. These are the forces of gravity and air friction that are working on this. So the pendulum would never be able to reach the same point ever again. And the class agreed. and, And she then asked the teacher if she could use him as a part of her presentation. The student asked the teacher to stand on a chair at the end of the classroom, and then she set up the pendulum with the 20-pound barbell. She attached the rope and made sure everything was secure. And the student raised the barbell to the nose of, of the teacher. And she adjusted the chair and everything so that the rope was tight and it's perfectly secure and tight against the teacher's nose. And she reminded the classroom... Now remember, because of gravity and the other forces working on the pendulum, the weight will not be able to get this high again. Based on the physics I just showed you, which all of you said you believe, when this weight swings back, it will not be able to reach the teacher's nose. Well, she let go of the weight. The weight dropped. And the teacher watched as it slowly swung away from him down the aisle between the desks, and the class collectively held their breath. The teacher watched as the weight slowed and then stopped and at the other side, stopped at the other side of the classroom and then started swinging back towards the teacher. The weight got closer and closer and suddenly the teacher jumped off the chair. He was afraid he was going to get his teeth knocked out. 
The teacher may have understood the physics in theory, but not, it didn't reach the inner disposition of his heart. He didn't really believe it. He didn't believe it enough to stand on the chair. His actions didn't match what he said he believed. I like that story because it's a reminder to me that belief is something that has to be more than a theory. It has to get into my heart. And my belief should show itself in the way that I act in the world. I have to be willing to act in a way that reflects my belief. If I jump off the chair like the teacher did, then I don't really believe. So as a part of our Lenten disciplines, let us not forget to look at the inner dispositions of our hearts. We, we traditionally do things like prayer and fasting and almsgiving and lots of other disciplines. But if they're just outward actions and they're not coming from a place in our heart of, of belief in God, then we should really, really scrutinize why we're doing these things. Let's, let's look at our hearts and get our hearts right with God as we do these things. Maybe we need to realign our compass because that is the foundation of all righteous actions.